Hello again, class. Today we're going to continue our series of lectures on the early republic. Uh, last time we talked about John Adams' presidency. Adams was the second president. Today we're going to talk about the third president, Thomas Jefferson. So, uh, like we did for Washington and Adams, let's briefly talk uh, about who Jefferson is and his background. Right. So, as you should know by now, he is a Democratic Republican. Remember, uh, it was his arguments and debates with Hamilton uh, during Washington's cabinet uh, that, that really led to the creation of the first political parties. Uh, so Jefferson, uh, by the time he runs against uh, Adams, is a Democratic Republican. Or excuse me, the, the head of the Democratic Republican Party. Uh, as you know, he's the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he was Washington's Secretary of State. And remember, uh, he's Adams' vice president because, remember, for these first few elections, uh, whoever came in second became the vice president. Whoever came in first became the president. And then the runner up became the vice president. Uh, here, uh, in just a couple minutes, we're going to talk about why that is no longer the system today. I'm finally finishing up on Jefferson's background. Um, uh, he opposed the National Bank, wanted to lessen the federal government's power. Um, and although I don't have him on the slide, uh, he uh, was like Washington. He was from Virginia. Uh, he owned a big plantation. He was a slaveholder. Uh, so he was part of that slaveholding Virginia plantation class uh, that's going to dominate the presidency in the first few years. We've already had Washington. Now we're having Jefferson. Uh, after Jefferson will come James Madison and James Monroe, both of whom are also um, you know, from Virginia and part of that slaveholding plantation class. All right, so a lot of the or four of the first five presidents all came from Virginia and all had pretty similar backgrounds. And Jefferson was certainly part of that. All right, so let's talk about, um, you know, why we have the 12th Amendment, uh, also known as uh, why Aaron Burr and Hamilton didn't like each other, or at least one reason. Uh, the 1800 election. So as I've told you um, a couple times now, up to 1800, Members of the Electoral College would vote for two candidates. All right, so you'd, you'd get a piece of paper, uh, and you'd write down two people who you wanted to be president. Now, obviously, you only have one president, but the person who came in second would be vice president. And this system worked fine uh, the first couple of elections. Uh, it didn't work fine in the 1800 election. Because by then, you really had people running uh, as part of political parties. All right, and so, all of the Democratic Republicans wanted Jefferson to be president and Aaron Burr to be vice president. Right. Similarly, uh, all the Federalists wanted Adams uh, to be uh, to be president, uh, and they were supposed to, um, you know, put their votes towards vice president, a guy named Pinckney, uh, which, as you see on this chart. The Federalists did. See how Adams has 65 votes and Pinckney only has 64? Well, one person, as they were supposed to do apparently, uh, voted for John Jay as the vice as Sorry, voted for John Jay during the election. That way, if Adams and Pinckney would have won, uh, Adams would have been the president and Pinckney would have been the vice president, the way the Federalists wanted. Uh, apparently, the Democratic Republicans couldn't figure out that that's how this should have worked or someone just forgot. Because as you see, you know, all the Democratic Republicans uh, in the Electoral College wanted Jefferson to be president and Burr to be vice. Or at least almost all of them did. Well, certainly most of them did. But the problem is, you wrote down two names, and they all wrote Jefferson, and every single one of them wrote Burr. Uh, so both Jefferson and Burr ended up with 73 votes in the Electoral College. So you had a tie. Now, the Constitution does explain what happens if, if you have a tie or if no one gets 50% of the votes or more than 50% of the votes to get to become president. Uh, the House of Representatives is to choose the president. And in 1800, the Federalists controlled the House of Representatives. All right, now, they're, they're going to lose it in the 1800 elections starting in 1801. That won't necessarily be the case. 
But in 1800, uh, the federal was still controlled by the House of Representatives. And remember, they wanted Adams to be president. They didn't want either Jefferson or Burr. So they voted 35 times and still couldn't come up with the winner. Uh, and Hamilton started telling his Federalist supporters that they should vote for Jefferson instead of Burr. All right, so finally, on the 36th vote, Jefferson wins the presidency uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, at which point Congress quickly passes uh, the 12th Amendment, uh, which requires that the Electoral College vote separately for president and vice president. Okay, so if you think back to the most recent election in 2020, you know, if you went into to the election booth and you saw a, a ballot, uh, you know, one line it was going to be Donald Trump president and uh, Mike Pence, vice president, on another line, it'd say uh, Joe Biden, president, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, vice president. All right. So you would vote on their specific uh, titles, specific positions. And then when the Electoral College gets together, they would vote separately. Uh, they say, okay, who's voting for president? And they'd all, uh, depending on how they were, were pledged and, and who won their state, uh, would either vote for Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And then they'd have a separate election, essentially, in the Electoral College for vice president, or at least a separate line on the ballot. And they had put down either Kamala Harris or Mike Pence. Uh, so that's how it happens now. Uh, but in 1800, it didn't happen that way. Uh, you had this tie, uh, which is why they, they passed the 12th Amendment. All right. So this, this system where the vice president was the person with the second most votes, uh, that only lasted four elections. Um, Jeff, uh, I'm sorry, Washington is two elections, the two times he was elected, uh, when John Adams was elected, and then now when the first time Jefferson was elected. Right. So as you see, uh, we're not really under the Constitution very quickly or for very long until you quickly have amended it 12 times. Uh, the first 10, as we know, are the Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, the 11th deals with some you know, arcane issues about suing states and things and jurisdiction. Uh, in, in legal matters. We won't get real talk about those, but do know that the 12th Amendment is what changed how we vote for president. All right. Uh, the most important legacy of Jefferson's president is the Louisiana Purchase. And look at the map here on the right. Uh, because today, when you say Louisiana, you think about that little state that looks like a boot uh, that's just east of Texas. And it's, you know, not a particularly large state. Uh, but the Louisiana Purchase uh, way back in 1803, as you can see, went from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Canada. Uh, it was uh, that large green area in the middle of the country. It essentially went from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. And it, and it took up, as you see, a, a huge portion of the country. And when Jefferson bought it uh, for $15 million, uh, it basically doubled uh, the size of the, the United States. All right, so look at uh, the map again. Uh, the, the pink area on the, the east of that map, to the right, um, you know, from the Great Lakes there all the way uh, down to the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that's what the country looked like at the start of 1803. Right? That's all that America had. Uh, but then look at that green area that Jefferson had in 1803, and you can see it's more or less a, about the same size. All right, so the country doubled. Okay? Basically, as a way of background, if you're curious, uh, Jefferson went to uh, France's leader, a guy named Napoleon, perhaps you've heard of him. Uh, and Napoleon was, was busy um, trying to fight basically every country in Europe at once. And this took a lot of his energy and time and money. Uh, so Jefferson went to him and said, hey, we'd really like to buy New Orleans from you. Uh, and Napoleon said, I'll sell you all of Louisiana. So uh, they paid 15 the U.S. paid $15 million and doubled the size of their country. All right, so think about this for a minute. Uh, did this lessen the federal government's power? Because remember, which party wants to a stronger federal government? Well, it's the Federalist Party. Jefferson's a Democratic Republican. All right? His party and Jefferson uh, is supposed to want a weaker federal government. But do you think doubling the size of the country uh, is going to weaken or strengthen the federal government? Well, it basically, it, I'm sorry, not basically, it absolutely strengthens the federal government because, remember, Louisiana, the territory is coming in. That's not a state right away. Right, remember the Northwest Ordinance, I kind of set the pattern, the precedent, the example. 
so to speak, for how you create states. And it basically determines on, you know, once you, enough people go to a particular land area, they, you know, they would carve it up for this giant territory into smaller areas. Uh, and once you get enough people, then you could create a state. All right, so many, many states are going to come out of the Louisiana Purchase eventually. Uh, but in 1803, it gave the federal government a huge uh, piece of land that the federal government was entirely con in control of. Uh, none of the states were in charge of the Louisiana Purchase. The federal government was. All right, so Jefferson did as much to uh, enlarge it, all right, to strengthen the, the power of the federal government uh, as any president, uh, you know, certainly the first 40 years of the country or so, uh, perhaps the first 70 or 80 years. All right, so understand this, this sort of contradiction and what Jefferson, uh, his ideals about how government should work uh, and then how it ended up working uh, when he was president. Because he realized he just couldn't uh, pass up the opportunity to, uh, to take the Louisiana purchase or take the Louisiana territory from France. Right, and why? Right, remember the Mississippi River. Right, I've told you before, you cannot, cannot underestimate the importance of the Mississippi River uh, during the 17 and 1800s of our country. Uh, you didn't have planes or trucks or, or cars or, or subways or anything like that. In 1803, you didn't even have trains yet. So the way um, goods or people moved, it was either by walking, either the person walking or, or an animal like a horse walking, um, or they moved by a boat uh, on a river or the ocean. All right, and so the the Mississippi River, all right, which is exactly, it runs that that line between the pink area and the green area on the map on your right. And that is uh, the way anybody in between the Appalachian Mountains and the Rocky Mountains would get uh, their goods to the Gulf of Mexico, which would then allow them to take them either to the east coast of America or onto Europe. Okay, So the Mississippi River was of vital importance. All right? It was basically the nation's highways and airports and train stations all rolled into one. Uh, you can't underestimate how important the Mississippi River was to, to, to commerce and the movement of peoples back then. Okay. Plus, Louisiana created enough land for every uh, American, or at least every white male American, to own a farm. And remember, Jefferson wants the country uh, to be based on agriculture. Okay? This was different than Hamilton, who wanted it to be based on industry and manufacturing and trade. Jefferson saw it as agriculture. And with the purchase of Louisiana, um, that created a lot, a lot of potential farmland for the country. Right? So you could really have this country, uh, or at least Jefferson thought it may work out this way, a country made up of just a bunch of farmers. Um, and certainly for a long time, um, you know, this country was very much agriculture-based, all right? Uh, this was still, when we're talking about 1803, we're still talking about a time where more people lived outside of cities than, than inside of cities. Uh, that's going to change in the 1900s, but certainly during Jefferson's lifetime, uh, this was a land of, of agriculture. Now, the problem for Jefferson and the country was no one really had any idea what was in Louisiana. Right? It was this huge territory uh, that at least Americans had never explored. Uh, it had belonged to, to France, it had belonged to Spain for a while before that, uh, but even, uh, you know, the French and Spanish hadn't really uh, explored a lot of it. So Jefferson bought this huge piece of land, and no one really knew what was there. Right? And the Federalists criticized him for that. They said, oh, great, you bought this land, you don't even know what you bought. Um, and that was kind of true. I've, I've heard or read it said before that you know, Americans knew more about the moon when we landed on the moon in, in 1969 uh, than we did about Louisiana when we bought it uh, in 1803. So, um, Jefferson immediately hired a, a couple of explorers. Um, a guy named, or two guys, one named Lewis, one named Clark. Uh, and they set out to explore Louisiana and also looking for a water route to the Pacific Ocean. Right. Remember, countries, including America, was still trying to find a way uh, that you, you could take a ship from, from Europe or the East Coast of America all the way to Asia. 
Uh, it was very time consuming to have to go all the way down around South America um, or if you're in Europe, you go all the way down around Africa to get to Asia. It was very time consuming. Uh, so they continued holding out hope uh, that there would be some river uh, that would essentially run from the east coast of America to the west coast. Uh, they're never going to find it, uh, but but they spent a lot of time looking, and, and that's what Lewis and Clark were looking for. Uh, but they were also just exploring the territory, uh, and uh, they did make a lot of scientific discoveries for America. They discovered a lot of new animals and plants and, and things like that that we hadn't known existed prior to then. Okay. And we'll talk more uh, about Lewis and Clark in Louisiana next month when we uh, deal with uh, the Western expansion of the United States. Okay, the other incredibly important thing that happened in 1803 was the Supreme Court case of Marbury versus Madison. Okay. Uh, this is every bit as important as the Louisiana Purchase because it establishes the concept of judicial review. Okay. Now, remember our, our seven principles of the Constitution, one of which is separation of powers, another of which is checks and balances. Remember, we, we separate the power, uh, the federal government's power, uh, we separate it into three branches, some in the judicial branch, some in the executive branch, some in the legislative branch. Okay. And the concept of checks and balances uh, kind of grows out of the separation of powers idea. Checks and balances says not only are the branches going to have separate power, but they're going to keep an eye on each other. They're going to check each other's power, keep it in check, so no one branch becomes too powerful. Uh, and judicial review is the, the court system's uh, check power, checking and balancing power. Uh, because what judicial review says is courts have the power to interpret the Constitution um, and laws and declare those laws to be unconstitutional. In other words, they violate the Constitution. Uh, so if the law is unconstitutional, it cannot be enforced. Okay. That's what um, judicial review is. Right. So write down and underline this name again. Marbury versus Madison equals judicial review. Write that down a couple times, underline a couple times. You must, must know that this concept of judicial review uh, arose out of Marbury versus Madison, uh, and that the case was in 1803, the same year as the Louisiana Purchase. All right. Now, if you want a little background uh, about the case, we're going to talk very, very briefly about it. Basically, what happens is, on the last day of his presidency, John Adams appoints a lot of Federalists uh, to various courts in the country. Courts and justices of the peace positions. So he points out these judges that, that he hopes are, are going to continue uh, supporting Federalist policy. He does that basically on his last day of office. Well, then Thomas Jefferson comes to power, comes to the presidency, and he names James Madison as the Secretary of State. And uh, Madison refuses to deliver these appointments. All right? So a guy named Marbury um, was supposed to be a justice of the peace. But Madison refuses to uh, deliver the paperwork to him uh, that gives him the job. And so he sues James Madison, and it goes to the Supreme Court. And what John Marshall, when John Marshall was the Supreme Court justice who decided this, remember our list of famous federals who talked about John Marshall. Uh, John Marshall is a very famous just, justice who sits in the court for over 30 years, and he writes Marbury versus Madison. And what he and the court decided was um, that the Supreme Court really didn't have the power to hear this case, uh, that it should have been brought in a different court. And where judicial review comes about is Marshall writes that, well, you know, Marbury thinks he can bring this case under what was known as the Judiciary Act of 1789 that, that gave the Supreme Court power to, to hear this type of case. Uh, but the Supreme Court said no. Uh, that part of that law is unconstitutional. Uh, the Constitution decided uh, what types of cases the Supreme Court uh, could hear, and it didn't give us power to hear this type of case. And so it was very, very much a technicality. All right? So we talk about this very extremely important concept of judicial review, uh, but the case itself was is kind of a technicality based on uh, where uh, lawyers and parties have to fire 
I'm excuse me, file particular lawsuits. And they ultimately heard or decided that the law that looked like it gave the Supreme Court power uh, to take Marbury's case uh, was itself unconstitutional, so the Supreme Court could not uh, hear Marbury's case. Uh, so in effect, uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson won this case, although it very much made Thomas Jefferson mad. Uh, Thomas Jefferson thought this idea of judicial review was, you know, was borderline tyranny because you had a bunch of judges who were not elected getting to tell Congress and the president what they could and couldn't do. And so Thomas Jefferson really hated this um, decision. He hated this idea of judicial review. Um, but what's he going to do about it? Because kind of technically his side won the actual case. So uh, there's some background on Marbury versus Madison. You must, must know Marbury versus Madison and judicial review. All right, let's talk about this um, quickly, Jefferson's second term. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase and Marbury versus Madison both happened in 1803, Jefferson's first term. Uh, things don't go well for Jefferson in the second term. And, and by the way, we're not going to study every every presidency uh, you know, from one to, to forty-five, but this this theme of, of presidents getting reelected and then having a, a tougher time uh, during their second term that's going to continue over and over again. It happens quite a bit, actually. It even happened a little bit uh, for Washington, but it certainly happens for Jefferson. Because even after you had the Jay Treaty, even after the X Y Z affair and the Quasi War that we talked about uh, with respect to Adams' presidency. Uh, Britain and France continued to impress American soldiers. Uh, remember, impressing a soldier is basically kidnapping. Kidnapping a sailor from, from one country and making them serve in the navy of another country. And both Britain and France continued to do this. Um, and so Jefferson decided he needed to punish both countries, so he passed the Embargo Act. Okay. The Embargo Act said that uh, no one in America uh, could trade with Britain or France. All right. We couldn't buy goods from them. Uh, they couldn't buy goods from us. Think about sort of like a boycott, but this is an actual law. Okay. So Jefferson basically shuts off all trade with Europe uh, between America and this had destroyed the, the United States economy and just about. Because remember, uh, the South economy was based on agriculture and they were selling a lot of their cash crops. Uh, like tobacco, uh, things like that. They were selling that in Europe, uh, but now Jefferson just made it illegal to do that. And remember Hamilton's plan when, when he was Secretary of Treasury under Washington, and, and then again Adams who followed these policies, had tried to build up manufacturing and industry in the North, and they relied on selling their goods to, to Europe. And then all of a sudden, all those, both of those uh, industries just came to a stop. All right, so Jefferson tried to punish Great Britain and France, uh, but he really ended up uh, punishing the Americans instead. Because Great Britain and France, uh, yeah, sure, they liked trading in America, but they had all of Europe to trade with. They could get by without us, uh, but America really needed those trading partners uh, back in 1807. So, Jefferson essentially bans all exports and imports to and from Britain and France. Uh, which, again, almost destroys the American economy. However, and here's the great irony uh, of all this, this did not actually keep Britain from impressing American soldiers. Uh, Britain would keep impressing American sailors. Okay, um, And so I'm going to give you a foreshadow warning. We're going to talk about this in the very next uh, lecture that I record uh, when we talk about the War of 1812. Uh, so that should give you a pretty big hint of, of what caused the War of 1812. Uh, so we'll finish Jefferson's uh, lecture here. Uh, just remember, probably three or four big things we need to take out of Jefferson's lecture. Uh, certainly how it, it began in 1800 with the tie and uh, America changed their constitution uh, to where you no longer voted um, for two people for president, you know, you vote for one person president and then a separate person for vice president. Um, understand this embargo act uh, in the late part of his presidency destroys the economy and, and doesn't end up preventing uh, what turns into the War of 1812. Uh, but the two big things that happened in between those events, 
Uh, both happened in 1803. The Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the country and with it increased federal power. Also, uh, Marbury versus Madison created the concept of judicial review, which gave the Supreme Court the power to rule laws unconstitutional, Supreme Court and other federal courts. Uh, and since federal courts now have this power, again, uh, this is giving more and more power to the federal government. All right, so we see, you know, Jefferson, who, who's always said, look, we shouldn't strengthen the federal government. All the power should be in the states, or at least most of it. Uh, two very big things happen in his presidency uh, that, in fact, uh, strengthen the federal government. All right, so we'll pick up there and Next time we'll talk about James Madison's presidency and the War of 1812.